You're listening to the Common Descent Podcast. Hello, Will. Hello, David. Hello, listeners, and welcome to episode 73 of the Common Descent Podcast. 73. Today, our episode topic is trees. Cool. Wait, we don't know about trees. We don't know anything about trees. And you know what that means. <gasps> alley episode. It's an alley episode. Woo! After the announcements and after the news, we will be joined by our recurring friendly neighborhood paleobotanist, Allie Baumgartner. So for those of you who like Allie, which seems to be quite a lot of you, <laughs> stay tuned. Trees is a really exciting topic. Yes. Because Allie's going to be here. And also because like grass back in episode 38, trees are a shape of plant, an innovation of plant lifestyle that completely reformatted the planet. Changed the face of the planet in the most literal sense. Exactly. So we're going to talk about what makes a tree, how trees got to be the trees that we know them today, and how they have changed the world over our Earth history. And I'm excited because I don't know anything about trees. I'm ready to learn. As oh, We love Alley episodes because yep. we just get to sit back and learn stuff. <laughs> it's just an entire episode of us going, no. Yeah, really? right. What? That's crazy. The other reason we're doing this episode is because it was requested yeah. by two of our patrons, Nils and Bob. Thanks, Nils and Bob. Thanks, folks. Hey, speaking of patrons, you know, we have this Patreon and our patrons get all sorts of cool goodies. So if you're a patron, you get bonus content, like bonus news. Mm -hmm. uh, after this episode, we'll have a recording with Allie after chat up on the Patreon. But one of the things you can get is that we'll say your name when you join us. Yeah. So we're going to do that. Hey, welcome to our newest higher level patrons, Sean, Eric, and Samantha. Welcome. Thanks for your support. Absolutely. We appreciate the support that our patrons give us. It allows us to continue doing the podcast as normal and also special bonus stuff. October just wrapped up. Yes, it did. Which means that all four episodes of 2019's Spooky series are out. We discussed this year. What, what did we discuss this year? We discussed Greek monsters. Harpies. Harpies. Gorgons. Hydras, Hydra, and Chimera. Yeah. yeah. So all those are out now. You can listen to our speculative evolution Halloween themed. We hope everybody who celebrates Halloween had a good time. Oh, and check our social medias. We shared some of the awesome art that some people made of these creatures that we described. So Go check it out. They did an awesome job. It's so good. It's we'll have so a fan cool. art gallery together should, yes. some, at some point. Yes, we should. So October just ended, and you know what that means. And November's it means coming. The, it, the year's almost over. Oh, yeah. And last year, we did this thing where we put out a Google form, and people could ask us questions, and we did an end-of-the-year Q&A. We should do that again. I was thinking that. Hey, let's do it again. All right, cool. Hey, listeners, if you'd like to participate in our 2019 end-of-the-year Q&A, keep an eye on our social medias. We will post links to the Google form where you can fill it out, just your name and your question. Yeah. Last year's end-of-the-year Q&A was about two and a half hours long, <laughs> so we'll see what happens this yeah. year. <laughs> so if you have a question, submit it. Last year, there were personal questions, there were science-y questions, there were random silly questions. Yeah, this is, this. what is it that you would most like to hear from us that we have not yet told you? Mailbag episode. Exactly. So keep an eye out for that. Listen to the stuff. Thanks to all of our patrons. Hey, you know what we like to do in between the announcements and the topic discussion? What? News. We do. Every episode, we pick news from the world of paleontology, science, and related topics. Will, what news do you bring to the table today? I just happen to have two pieces. Oh. And the first one is about how certain dinosaurs cooled themselves with their respiratory system. This seems to be a recurring theme on our podcast. Yeah. I, when I saw it, I was like, oh, I've talked about this once before. I want to talk about it again because I love this topic. So this is dealing with a study that looked at 
blood vessel passages on the skulls of different dinosaurs and found that different large dinosaurs seem to have found different solutions to cooling themselves. Neat. Yeah. This is research by Rugger Porter and Lawrence Whitmer in anatomical in the anatomical record and the articles by Carolyn Gramling in Science News. And basically, this is research that using CT scanning and x-rays formed 3D images of various dinosaur skulls and were able to map the blood vessel passages that were preserved in the bone. What a time to live in. It's so sci-fi and I love it. By comparing those to modern relatives of dinosaurs, you know, so birds and reptiles, they were able to find that there seems to be different systems in place. Now, the reason this question is so important is because big dinosaurs face the very real problem of thermoregulation, of overheating. If you're huge, you retain your heat more easily, and if you're anywhere hot, retaining that heat becomes bad. And according to certain chemical analyses of things like sauropod teeth, it seems that they were keeping relatively comparable temperatures to today's animals. Interesting. Which means very likely some kind of thermoregulation is going on. Now that is extremely notable because sauropods were the largest dinosaurs, making them larger than the largest land mammals by orders of magnitude. Yeah, like this is a big that we have not seen on land for a long time. Dozens of tons. So these big, long-necked dinosaurs seem to have been keeping their temperature to a reasonable level. So they wanted to figure it out. And what they found was an interesting series of answers. A number of big groups, or a number of groups of big dinosaurs, I should say, found different ways, it seems, to control their temperature through respiration. Ankylosaurs, which we've mentioned in a previous news, episode, had... Well, I'm, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. I jumped... I, I, went to, I went to do my episode yes. thing. We talked about them in episode 69, Absolutely. but you're right. We discussed them in the news, I think, in episode 68. I think so. Yeah. And in both of those, we mentioned that they have massive sinuses. So their, their uh, nasal passage, specifically, is expanded and seems to be connected to heat regulation, cooling the air uh, before it gets into the body. Sauropods, on the other hand, have blood vessels that go into the nostrils and their mouth, which suggests that they may have been panting. Oh. That they actually may have been keeping themselves cool like many mammals do today. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> what in the world would a pant from a sauropod sound like? <sighs> it's like a bellows. <laughs> <laughs> this is the content that our listeners tune in for. <laughs> but yet... There is another weird thermoregulation. Theropods, like big theropods, T-Rex, and Allosaurus, so, and so forth, seem to also be using their sinuses, but in a different way. There's extra air cavities connected to the jaw muscles that seem to be rich in blood vessels, which could suggest that by opening and closing their mouth, they could pump blood into the or pump air into the sinuses and cool it. So they'd be almost mouthing, according to this. And Whoa cooling themselves off by physically pumping the air so all those uh paleo art reconstructions of tyrannosaurs with their mouths open yeah, they're not roaring they're just very hot they're just they're just warm <sighs> <sighs> <laughs> and so yeah some interesting suggestions for how these animals were regulating their heat there's not a lot more to these results it's just some interesting findings when the blood vessels were looked at one of my favorite things about dinosaurs we talked about this in episode 21 dinosaurs where th this notion that you know people often ask well oh, how did dinosaurs manage to be so big and the reality is that dinosaurs hit those giant sizes over and over mm -hmm. and over like several different groups of dinosaurs independently convergently episode 70 yeah evolved those enormous sizes and so they achieved that lifestyle in different ways here we have three different uh, avenues to solving the problem of having a giant hot body. Yeah, it's it's very interesting as, as to me as well because there seem, there are parallels with how animals do it today that we recognize, and then also some that are if probably not wholly unique. I don't know enough about respiratory re uh, thermoregulation in modern animals. That's too soft tissuey for me. <laughs> uh, but like some of these are weird, and that's. 
it's yeah. cool that dinosaurs landed on multiple solutions. I hypothesized that Triceratops had big ears like <laughs> an elephant. <laughs> Can't prove me wrong. <laughs> it's t- I, I'm surprised we haven't found a theropod that has the big ostrich fanning feathers. <laughs> you know, I, 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 well could have. Well, my bit of news is about a much less famous group of an- prehistoric animals, trilobites. Uh, but they should be. That was a, a, a tongue-in-cheek, you see. <laughs> trilobites are, as far as invertebrate fossils go, possibly the most famous fossils in the world. These are the many segmented bugs, arthropods, that spanned across the entire Paleozoic. You've probably seen them all over the place. This particular research that I'm going to talk about is about trilobites in single file lines. Waiting for something? To hide their numbers. <laughs> <laughs> this is research by Jean Vanier et al. in Scientific Reports, and we'll link to an article in Live Science by Stephanie Papas. This research identifies specimens of a, a species of trilobite called Ampix priscus from the early Ordovician of Morocco, so just under 500 million years ago, and they are found, as the, uh, the, the paper describes them, in in situ, monospecific, linear clusters. <laughs> Single file lines. <laughs> you gotta love scientific jargon. <laughs> oh, I love it. They found 21 clusters of trilobites, ranging from 3 to 22 individuals in straight lines, lined up one behind the other like school children. That's crazy. They are all facing the same direction. Often, now, the, these trilobites have uh, little round bodies with long spines coming off of them. Yeah, they have those those weird swoop backs. Yeah. And these authors noted that in many cases, the spines are touching the adjacent trilobites. So they're not like following several inches behind. They are keeping some degree of contact with each other. Ooh. Straight-ish, single file lines of trilobites. And because they're all facing the same direction, they're in contact, they're consistent distance from each other, there's no evidence of them being moved around, they appear to be buried in situ, which means they weren't, like, washed into a valley and buried in a line. It looks like they were actually traveling in a line when they were buried. Huh. Which raises all sorts of interesting questions. Also, uh, we will uh, send... We'll have the link to this and all the other news in the blog post. Click the link. Look at these pictures. It's so cool. They are pretty awesome. Now, a uh, couple things to note about these trilobites. They are in the... There was just over 100 different trilobites across the various clusters. Only one was a juvenile. They are all adults or near adults. So it's not like ducklings. You know, it's not like mama trilobite leading her ducklings. They are also blind and thought to move around either by motion sensor, sensor, you know, through those long spines that they have, or chemical cues. Hmm. So they're not keeping an eye on each other. They are following each other's either scent or feel as they're moving in these lines. Literally the blind leading the blind. It Indeed it is. Huh. The authors note that this kind of motion, we see similar things today. A lot of uh, arthropods, a lot of bugs and crustaceans and stuff are gregarious at times, so they'll they'll group together. Modern-day spiny lobsters... That's the one. ...will do this. Yes. The authors note that they will line up and walk in single file during stormy months. They will walk in these lines through the quietest waters to stay safe. Yeah. And usually when they do this, their antennae are touching the one uh, in front of and behind them. So we see this same behavior today. Now, these trilobites might have been doing it for the same reason. Indeed, the authors point out that the nearby sediments, so where these trilobites were found, show evidence of what, what are called turbidites, evidence of storm deposits. So sediment that was deposited rapidly and unusually in storm conditions. And in fact, the trilobites themselves in these clusters don't show signs of a struggle in their burial. 
and were probably buried rapidly under these underwater landslides and churning sediments and stuff. So they may very well have been trying to stick to quieter waters just like spiny lobsters do today. That's awesome. That's particularly cool, not only because we have fossilized behavior, which, woo, that's always awesome, but this is also not behavior that one might have expected from a trilobite because so often trilobites are considered or just assumed to have been you know very primitive early attempts at an arthropod you know i say attempt they were highly successful but still like they were early on so it's easy to not assume any sort of complex behavior or especially interactions uh but this is really interesting it means you could see them doing a lot of more complicated more intricate behavioral things that we see crabs and crustaceans and lobsters doing today Yes, and indeed, that is one of the points that the paper makes, that this is a among the earliest evidences of collective behavior. Ah. It's been seen in younger trilobites in France, so not just in one place, multiple places, and apparently there are some Cambrian uh, arthropods that have been shown doing a similar marching in a line thing. Huh. So this is not only evidence of behavior. By the way, they point out that it could be the storm deposit thing. It could also be that they were uh, migrating to breeding grounds. Yes, because I I know there are lobsters that will do that. They'll migrate as big groups. Yep. Because they can't swim. They just walk miles across the sand. Yeah. Gents, take a walk. (laughs) But this indicates sort of where... It gives us clues as to where this kind of behavior originated Mm -hmm. and so really cool by the way i missed it a second ago episode 61 behavior in the fossil record (laughs) i gotta keep up right it was we're getting to where almost every other word's gonna be (laughs) (laughs) i can't wait by the time we hit triple digits 50 percent of the words in every episode will be other episodes we're just gonna have to record a third track (laughs) that will be in the background yeah you episode 33 episode 24 episode 55 uh that's super cool neat well, my next bit of news is about an arthropod. Oh. Uh, and it has to do with ears, like the big ears Triceratops must have had. Right. Moth ears. Okay. Yeah. Moths famously have big elephant ears. Yeah. Not big ears, but ears that listen for bats. Oh. Yeah. Certain moths are known to have ears that listen for ultrasonic sounds to avoid bats. Yes, I've heard of it. And actually, I think did we we may have talked about this. I think this. we mentioned it. In episode 52, Sounds on the Fossil Record. I think we mentioned it. And so this research is dealing with that topic because for the longest time, it has been, you know, pretty much assumed that it's like, yeah, bats started flying, started echolocating, started hunting these flying insects, and some of them developed the ability to hear that echolocation. Makes sense to me. Yep. This research says, nope, the moths had ears first. That does not make sense to me. Go on. So this is research by Akito Kawahara et al., in the Proceedings of National Academy of Sciences. And the article we're leaking to is by Ed Young in The Atlantic. So the basic story that has been pretty much the given in bat and moth research is that when bats took flight, their, this new source of nighttime predation that could see you in the dark using sound was enough to drive moths, certain moths, to develop ears. Not ears like our ears, but the ability to hear that echolocation and avoid it. What this new research is showing is that most lineages of moths evolved their ears, because it's evolved multiple times, before bats developed echolocation, and in most cases by, like, at least 28 million years. Wow. So, like, they, for a long time, had ears, and then bats came along. So, yeah, why? Why do they have these ears? This becomes even weirder when you look at the fact that a lot of their ears are tuned to ultrasonic sounds. So to try to answer this question, they first wanted to get a better idea of the overall history of moths. So they went and collected moths. They went to forests around the world at night with ultraviolet lights, collected them, compared the genetics of 186 species. Ooh. Yeah, this is a substantial study. And created a new family tree uh, that shows how these different groups are related. From that, uh, I don't know how much it disagreed with previous ones, but they created one using this genetic material 
it also allowed them to map the major milestones in their evolutionary history, particularly hearing. So moth history goes back 300 million years to when the earliest ancestors of moths showed up. But we start seeing some of the interesting things more recently. About 98 million years ago is when some moths went from being nocturnal to diurnal and gave rise to butterflies. Uh Aha. Yeah, which one of the uh, authors, I think, or one of the researchers said are a, described butterflies as a group of particularly uninteresting diurnal moths. (laughs) (laughs) Take that, butterflies. Yeah, very barbed. (laughs) But the reason this one's interesting is because bats have been blamed in this instance of their evolution as well. A while back, there was the suggestion that when bats came into the, the playground, they forced a number of moths to try to evade them by flying in the day. Oh, but bats didn't show up until about 55 to 65 million years ago. Uh, As we know from episode 59. Exactly. Bats. And it looks like they also didn't start echolocating until a little bit after that. So once again, butterflies were doing butterfly stuff on their own without bats. So we've attributed a lot of stuff on these, this group of insects because of bats. But it turns out that no, they've been doing their thing for a while. The hearing comes up because it seems like moths evolved their hearing on nine separate occasions. Cool. So yeah, very diverse. They're on different parts of the body on different moths. Like, (laughs) it's super weird. Uh, Most occurred between 78 and 92 million years ago. Okay, so in the Cretaceous. Yes. So they were listening to stuff well before anything we know of were echolocating. There are some groups that evolved it later. Uh, The hawk and nocturnal hydalid butterflies both developed their hearing later on. So those could be connected to bats. You know, it's not like it's wholly separate, but most, the vast majority, I think they said about 96% of hearing moths seem to have evolved that hearing ability long before bats. So what were they listening to? And to answer that, they looked at areas without bats. Oh. They went to Arctic regions and various islands where moths that can hear are present, but not bats. And what they found is in many of those situations, the moth's ears are tuned to a lower frequency. So they're not listening to ultrasonic sounds. They're listening to more mundane noises that would tune into rustling or flapping of a predator. Oh. So they think that moth evolution, moth ear evolution was just in response to environmental sounds. Then bats showed up. Then they started tuning those ears to a higher frequency to listen to the bats. So yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, exactly. So it's a situation that seems straightforward, but is much more complex when you actually look at the animal in question. So it could then very well be, it, it could still be that they were listening for predators. Yes. But birds... And pterosaurs, perhaps. Yeah. And then when bats came along, the moths were like, oh, okay, well, now we have to turn the dial up. Because mm-hmm. they're cheating. Yes, exactly. These, these bats are, <laughs> are getting away with stuff. <laughs> yeah. I love it because it just makes me think how many other arms races are we misinterpreting because yeah. we're assuming uh, a causal relationship that's not there. Well, I, I, I noticed that with uh, snakes. Snakes get that a lot. Mm-hmm. I have heard a on of, of of behavioral things in animals blamed on snakes. Yeah, that they're scared of snakes. Like, I've heard that as an explanation for why cats play with string. Yep. And I do, I've never read if there's any actual studies on that. I don't know of any. That sounds like it's not a thing. Well, that's the same reason that, uh, what was it, Rick and Morty gave for why cats hate cucumbers. Uh, in one of the episodes, they reference that it's they think it's a snake, so that's why they freak out. See, that's we and yeah. Then, yeah. Uh, so yeah, these kinds of studies are always fun to to look at. It's very interesting. Well, it's intriguing that your second news piece was a massive genetic analysis of a group of life that we rarely talk about on the podcast. Because my second news bit is a massive genetic analysis of a group of life that we rarely talk about on the podcast. Hey, plants. Oh, hey, convenient. Convenient for this episode. These are the results of a major study performed by the 1000 Plant Transcriptomes Initiative. Good name. Published in the journal Nature. That's what it is. And it's not like so-and-so at all. It's 
the 1000 Plan Transcriptones Initiative in nature. The initiative comprises about 200 scientists. Wow. So it's a nature paper. We will link to an article that includes the press release from the Florida Museum. (gasps) This study sought to help sort out the evolution of green plants. Which is a, 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 it's a big goal. That's a big question. Green plants includes, you know, algae, green algae, as well as our familiar land plants like mosses and ferns and conifers and flowering plants and so on. There are up in the range of 500,000 species. So of, a few. So a few of green plants today. But as with all groups, their evolution requires uh, uh, fine tuning. Most genetic studies, so they they were seeking to do the same thing that you just described with the moths, is how can we get a broad swath of genetic information to interpret when changes happened in their evolutionary history? Most work that's been done on this has been done with crops, because they're easy to get a hold of, and a few model plant species that are just the common research ones. Which is cool and all, but that really restricts you to very specific parts of the plant evolutionary tree, so to speak. So in this study, now, your st- I don't want to diminish, because <laughs> you said it was, what, 186 yep. species of moths? That's really cool. Yes. And I don't want to take away from that study. This study <laughs> <laughs> collected transcriptome uh, data, and transcriptome is the full set of expressed genes. So the genes that you're, that you're using, basically, in the body. From 1,124 species of plants. Wow. Well, those don't run away. It's true. They're easier to find. (laughs) Well, they're easier to catch anyway. (laughs) So green plants, red algae, within the green plants, outside the green plants. This was a huge study. And they made the note that a couple of major challenges faced them when trying to do this. One was they had to collect all that. Yeah. So apparently, transcriptome data is best when you get it from fresh tissue. So researchers all around the world went out into the into nature and started collecting plants. The other thing they noted is that they had to rework software that analyzes this kind of data so that it could handle this much data. Wow. That's a lot. 1,100 species worth of transcriptome data. But it paid off. They found all sorts of cool things. For one, a little taxonomic note, their data did confirm old suspicions that the bryophytes, I believe they're called, mosses, liverworts, and hornworts, are one related group, which has been debated recently. Cool. Support for an old idea. More intriguingly from the evolutionary standpoint uh, that they were very excited to see is that they found more evidence of the evolutionary history of one of the most famous genetic tricks that plants like to pull, which is whole genome duplication. This is a thing plants just do. Like, when you go through the evolutionary history of plants, it'll be like, all right, we're hanging out, we're hanging out, we're hanging out, and now I have three times my genome. (laughs) Like, a duplication is a thing you may have learned about in biology class. It's like, oh, this gene was copied twice. And that's how you, you know, you're a little bit of a trait became a lot of that trait. Now we're producing tons of venom or whatever it is. Plants will just do that with their entire genetic complex. It's just greedy. This is well known in groups like ferns and angiosperms, flowering plants, episode 57. And they found a bunch of examples of it. They also found previously unrecognized examples in groups like conifers. So it is a widespread trait that has a major impact on the evolutionary history of plants and their modern genetic makeup. Another thing that plants will do genetically is sometimes instead of a major shift in the whole genome, they will expand a particular gene family, right? So this cluster of genes expands, radiates, they get all sorts of different changes in it. And they found that a gene expansion of that kind correlates with just before land plants arise and the evolution of the vascular system, xylem and phloem, and water transport. Oh, interesting. So these major genetic shifts may point us towards the reasons behind big innovations in plant evolution, but not always, because they found that the base of things like the origin of seed plants and the origins of angiosperms did not see that. 
Hmm. In fact, around the time that angiosperms expand, they found a shrinking of certain gene families. So perhaps they were specializing on a particular lifestyle instead of expanding their genetic uh, ingredient complex. Huh. So, believe it or not, plant evolution is complicated. How weird. It's It's got so many ins and outs to it. Yeah, so they're looking... Basically, the, the idea here is the better understanding we have of the genetic history of plants of various groups at various times will help us to understand how they came to be, how certain genetic features are related to certain functions of plants, which is interesting, you know, for nerds like us who just like to know how things changed over time. Yep. But also, you know, under, better understanding the functioning of genetics in plants is helpful for agriculture and helpful for medicine. Yeah. Important stuff to know. Cool. That is an impressive study, like a ridiculously impressive study. That's very, very awesome. And it's it's neat that we're revealing such weird, or that we're starting to reveal hints about such weird features. Uh, I'm sure I would have something more insightful to say if I knew more about the backgrounds of some of these <laughs> mysteries, but that's super cool. It is is two other notes. The press release points out that this data is made publicly accessible, which is awesome. Anyone can work with it. And that now that they have accomplished the 1000 Plant Transcriptome Initiative, the group will now move on to their next goal, which is 10,000. <laughs> so in another decade, we'll see what they find. Yeah, that's hey. that's... Those kinds of studies are the ones that build the foundation for, like, future major regime shifts in science. Oh, yeah. Like, stuff like this is the thing that down the line is going to let someone go, oh, wait, I just noticed this connection across all these groups that's going to have a an aha moment yeah. for how we... Like, it's these kinds of things that are... are I'm not, not necessarily flashy, but super important and useful. That's so cool. And it's just a ton more data. Yes. So it'll be useful for broad scale stuff, but also like somebody who wants to study that one species of such and such in the rainforest of wherever it is now has a bunch of data on that species. Yes. So very cool stuff. Hey, speaking of plant evolution and the evolutionary history of green plants, you want to talk about trees? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I think it's a good time. Cool. They're kind of a big deal. Well, but if we're going to talk about trees, we need Allie. Yes, we do. So let's go get her. All right, cool. Hi, Allie. Hello. Welcome back. I'm so happy to be here. We are so happy to have you. We're going to talk about trees. And forests. The best things. Now, at the beginning of this episode, we will have stated that this topic was requested by Nils and Bob. We will have already thanked Nils and Bob. But yes. what we will have not said, and which I'm, I waited till now to say, we got two requests to talk about trees. We have also received four requests for Allie to come back to the podcast. Yes, Yay! we have. <laughs> Devin, Teodora, Maggie, and Tawny have all sent us messages specifically saying, bring Allie back. More Allie, please. Yay! And, and in total, we've gotten at least a dozen requests, people just having wonderful things to say about you. <laughs> so, we are happy to have you back, and so are at least a dozen of our listeners. <laughs> by, liter <laughs> by literally popular demand. Oh, yes. that's great. I, that's, I've never gotten that before. That's very exciting. <laughs> Now, for the people who are new, before we get into trees, please introduce yourself. Hello, my name is Allie Baumgartner. Funny story, my last name literally means tree farmer. So, <laughs> nominative determinism. <laughs> uh, you got the right person. Yes. Did it. Uh, and I am a PhD candidate at Baylor University. I am a paleobotanist. So I study ancient plants uh, as well as modern plants and how we can understand the relationship between plants and the environment that they live in, and how we can use that for paleoclimate reconstructions. So you could say that I am a huge tree nerd. Nice. I have called well, myself the Paleolorax, so that's me. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. 
Well, then let's jump right in to our main topic. Ali, I'm going to start out with a question that is a very simple question, which what with what I expect to be an extraordinarily complicated answer. What is a tree? So you're completely correct. That is a very simple question with a very complicated answer. So I'm first going to start off with what is not a tree? Okay. <laughs> so Rocks. palm trees, not trees. Ooh. Um, Tree ferns, not trees. So the reason that those are not trees is because I have... there. It's not I have. There is a very pedantic definition for what is a tree. And being a tree nerd, I, I follow that definition. So the first and most important thing is that it has to be a vascular plant. So a vascular plant has tissues that allow it to uptake water, which means that it's not just like a layer of plant on the ground. So basically that means that it's not a moss, it's not a liverwort, it's not a hornwort. Okay, cool. Vascular plant. The second thing is it needs to be perennial. So it's to live for multiple years. So if you only live for one year, you're probably not going to grow enough to be a tree. There are some exceptions to that in the fossil record, but we'll get to that. Um, they must, and this is the most important thing in my mind, they must have secondary growth. So primary growth is just the tree growing up and down. So the stems growing up and the roots growing down. Secondary growth is when it expands in diameter. So trees put on rings every year. So that is the secondary growth. It's expanding in, in its diameter. Um, it has to have a single stem. If it has more than one stem, it is either a shrub or a bush. So it's not a tree. And in addition, they tend to be at least 20 feet or six meters tall. Any shorter than that, and it's probably a shrub or a bush. So okay. it has to be a vascular plant, has to be a perennial, has to have secondary growth, has to have a single stem, and has to be at least 20 feet tall. So it sounds like tree is less of a group of life, like a like a related clade, like a group of life, like cats or like whales, and more of a form and lifestyle description. So in botany, we would call it a habit. It has okay, a tree right. habit. Um, so yeah, it is... It is just a trait <laughs> rather than an actually uh, taxonomically useful group. Uh, many different groups, living and extinct, have been trees. Um, so today, it's only conifers, so gymnosperms, you know, pine trees, things like that, and angiosperms, so the flowering plants, basically every tree you see. Um, there is a single monocot. That is a uh, a tree. I did not know this until I was doing research for this episode. So uh, the monocot dracaena technically has secondary growth, but they do it differently than dicots. Um, so other angiosperms, which is really interesting. So I was going to say no monocots are trees. That is technically wrong. There is a single monocot that is a tree. <laughs> so most of the plants we know are dicots. Yes. Right. What is, in brief, what is the difference between um, mono and dicots? The difference between a monocot and a dicot has to do with the actual uh, morphology of the seed. Um, so a monocot means that it has a it is monocotyledonous, which means that there is a single baby leaf when it is, so when it first germinates, a single baby leaf, and then dicotyledonous means that there are two baby leaves. Um, Monocot is an actual taxonomic group. Eudicot, so true dicots, is a true taxonomic group. However, how we use dicot in like um, colloquially, colloquially, we include things that are not eudicots, but it's basically non monocot angiosperms. But that <laughs> takes too long to say, so we just call them dicots. So, like, um, magnolias are not eudicots. They are much more primitive, but they're not monocots. So we call them dicots. Okay. <laughs> Sounds like another episode. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I could go into that. <laughs> so trees then are an example of, hey, episode 70, convergent evolution. It's true. That this is something that has appeared sort of, sort of. Now, I always think of, you mentioned secondary growth, mm -hmm. which in a tree is wood. Yes. Right? That's the layers of bark. Do trees have to be woody? Uh, yes. That's that's okay. the only way that you really the only way you get secondary growth 
is with lignin. In the past, that might not have been the case, um, but no, I don't know of other ways that you can do secondary growth. The only other woody plant that I didn't previously mention are vines. So oh, vines yeah. sort of fit the definition if we're super pedantic, <laughs> um, but they're not self they're uh, not self supporting. So they okay. have to rely on other things. So you can get a really tall liana, which is a name for a woody vine that is woody. It's putting on secondary growth. Um, and it could be more than 20 feet. Um, and it's a vascular plant. They are perennial. They're not self-standing. They're self-supporting. So not a tree. But I don't think people would confuse lianas with trees. So I'm yeah. not, I, I, I feel safe in leaving them out. <laughs> so... A tree. There, there aren't there also plants that are sometimes trees. <laughs> yes. Because like, isn't isn't poison ivy like sometimes a vine and sometimes a shrub? So well, that's so in the genus Toxicodendron, which is <laughs> side note, fantastic genus Toxicodendron, <laughs> which, which uh, means toxic tree. Um, nice. So there is poison ivy, which is a vine, and then you have poison oak, which is a shrub. But the line between shrub and tree is wiggly. Um, so that's something that I personally have run into problems with, that my definition is that it has to be at least six meters tall. To, it must be at least two, um, two inches in diameter um, to count as a tree. So sometimes species will have multiple stems, like the same species will have multiple stems um, and will be, you know, five feet tall and less than an inch in diameter. And then sometimes the exact same species <laughs> will be, you know, obviously a tree. And so that's the issue. It's not taxonomically, it's not a taxonomic group. It's a life habit. So that means that sometimes, you know, they want to do other things with their lives. So it's, it's complicated. It's kind of like how there can be color morphs right. of, of a single species, like the, the uh, eastern rat snake, which is right. a different color all up and down the east coast, but they're all just yeah. eastern rat snake. Yeah, right. exactly. If they, were, if they were plants, the different color morphs would vary, but from six meters long yeah, exactly. to one meter long, and they'd have multiple heads sometimes. <laughs> yeah, and then, and then spontaneously one group would decide, I'm going to double my genome, and, you know, we'll just go from there. <laughs> How many genomes you want? <laughs> oh, plants are kind of jerks, so but I love them. So lots of different groups of plants have uh, independently evolved this tree habit. Why? What makes this so good? Why is it so good to be a tree? That's a good question. So it is, it's hard to kill a tree, right? So there are ways to do it, but they tend to be very specific. So if you think of like, um, the emerald ash borer, it bores into ashes. It is specifically to kill ashes. Um, it has exploited an, uh, a weakness in, in the ash tree. Um, chestnut blight, again, it's very specific. And so it is, it is hard to kill a tree. Um, and it's also, it's good to be a tree. Like, it's good to be the king <laughs> sort of thing. Like, if you think about in, like, a rainforest, those big trees... Once they get done fighting each other, they don't really have to compete because their roots are deep. They can get all the nutrients they need. Their limbs are tall. They can get all the light that they need. Um, it is an investment um, of resources. To <laughs> Secondary growth is not easy. You know, you're expanding up and down and out at the same time. But if you can make that investment, you know, some trees live thousands of years. So it's kind of the the are adapted k adapted. Are you you know live fast die young? Just get your kids out there and then die, or is this the all right? I'm going to see my great great grandchildren um, sort of thing. So and it also has to do with the amount of precipitation. All plants are thirsty, but trees are thirsty. So if you have some place with a lot of water, you know trees are going to love that. You don't really see trees in arid environments. Okay, makes sense. One more question. What the heck is a palm tree, then? It's a palm. Okay, moving on. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Big sigh. Big sigh. Uh, no, it's, it's a palm. 
So you technically shouldn't say it's like you would you could, shouldn't call it a starfish. It's a sea star. Um, yeah. It's not a palm tree. It's a palm. So what is what you're actually seeing are um, it's basically support. If I remember correctly, it's where the previous leaves have fallen off, and it's just like root support. Um, so instead of being straight up and down at the base, they they get a little bit wider because you have to hold up this thing because they don't have deep roots. Um, they actually have a really shallow root ball, so they, they can't anchor themselves under the ground, so they kind of have to prop themselves up ab- above ground. So the technical, technically, I would just say, call it a palm. Drop the tree. It's an extra <laughs> syllable. You don't need it. Just call it a palm. A very yeah. tall, not tree. Yes. Because I mean, they, they've just gotten called trees because they're tall. Yeah. Right. Well, it's like we talked in episode 70 about banana trees, which are also not trees. Yes. They're palms. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this is getting very confusing. So palm trees, not trees, banana trees, not trees. What are trees? Okay. What is so, the modern diversity of trees like? The whole planet is trees, basically. So if you have ever seen a picture of... So NASA has the, the cloudless sky picture of, of the Earth. And if you ever look at that, that's how my advisor starts every talk talking about plants. Um, if you look at that, most of the planet is green. And most of that green is trees. So uh, more so of the major terrestrial biomes, more than half of them are dominated by trees. And even the ones that aren't dominated by trees, trees are normally present. So if you think about, like, tropical rainforest, you know, that is obviously dominated by trees, you know, high temperature, high precipitation. So that's along the equator. And then as you move out north and south, you have tropical seasonal forests. So not as hot, not as wet. If you move out from that, you have um, woodland and shrubland. So basically the transition between a forest and a grassland. So you have this woodland that's dominated by trees. When you go further north, avoiding those desert bands there, north and south, um, you'll get to your temperate rainforests. Those tend to be on every continent except for Africa, and they tend to be little patches um, on the coast. And then you get into your temperate deciduous forests, which are probably the second largest biome. Probably the second largest. Um, and it's what's dominated in, it's what dominates in the northern hemisphere. So we have in North America, there's a lot of temperate deciduous forests. In Eurasia, there's a lot of temperate deciduous forests. And then once you get even further north, you don't really see it. You don't have this in the southern hemisphere, but further north, you have the taiga, or the boreal forest. It is the largest terrestrial biome. I didn't know that until I looked this up because you kind of forget. It's just cold and it's just cold up there. I don't think about what's up there, Um, (laughs) but it's the largest and it's the only um, modern tree dominated biome that is not dominated by angiosperms. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Interesting. Episode 57 for more on what that means. So every other, so, you know, tropical rainforest, temperate rainforest, all, every other forest is dominated by angiosperms, except for the taiga. That's gymnosperms. That's conifers, which is really interesting. Wow. This is one of the things that I would, one of the reasons I was excited about this episode, like grass, trees are a form of life that defines entire biomes yeah that like it is you this whole swath of the planet is trees and that de- that determines most of the other features of that landscape yeah i mean it's 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 to the point like if aliens were to come in and define our planet they'd be like the wet one with the trees yeah it's water and trees yeah you know yeah. If, i mean because if you were doing it from satellite that's what you that's what you'd get is Lots of trees and then lots of water and then you go back to trees and then there are weird patches without that, but we know, actually mostly. so we actually don't know how many trees there are on the planet. That's fantastic. Yeah, that makes sense. Which is exactly because <laughs> who first of all who's gonna go count all of the trees? It sounds like a citizen science project, <laughs> right? But there are a lot of trees where there aren't people. Is the issue? Um, so the way that they do it is actually by satellite. Um, so you, you can get a sense for, you know, the average canopy size, well, there's this much canopy, 
there's probably this many trees, but that's only going to get you the top level of the canopy. Many forests are multi-storied, so some, you know, some of our friends are not even getting up into that top level of the canopy. So, who knows? Who knows how many trees there are? What defines a forest? Ooh. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, according to my understanding, it has to do with canopy cover. So the difference between like a woodland and a forest is how much of the sky is blocked out by trees. Um, So Reagan Dunn, who's now at La Brea, um, she's a paleobotanist. And so what she has done is she has developed this really, really cool um, proxy to get a sense of canopy cover in the fossil record. So... (laughs) Leaves of plants are made to collect light. That is the point. They use them for photosynthesis. And so um, the cells in the outside of the leaf, where it is, you know, looking at the sun, um, depending on the amount of light that it's getting, will be a different shape. Right. And I can't remember which way it goes, but it has to do with how wiggly the margins are. So is yeah. it like super squiggly or is it super smooth? I think it's spiky in the in warmer regions and smoother in cooler regions because it has to do with water retention. Mm-hmm. I oh, think no, yeah, for, that's for the uh, that's for the edge of the leaf. Yeah, that's the edge oh, of the leaf. That's for oh, the edge is, of the leaf. I'm thinking of a different, I, but I remember that. That's that's true. I am very proud of you. I have well, talked this. <laughs> no, so so these are epidermal cells. So this is like a layer down oh, the I actual see. shells, the shape of the cells of the epidermal layers, so that top layer of the leaf. Um, the squiggly versus, because it has to do with, I can't remember which is which, but um, being able to collect as much light, light as possible. And so you can basically, pl- like, you know, calculate how squiggly it is um, and use that to calculate, is this completely covered? There's basically no light coming through or is there, you know, n- absolutely no canopy? You know, you're in Montana and there's nothing around you for as far as the eye can see, which I... So that's that's the main way that you can tell um, is by so that's the main way that you can differentiate between a woodland and a forest is a woodland is going to be much more open. A forest is a closed canopy. Okay, very cool. cool. So all trees rule the world. They are everywhere. But that has not always been the case, as is my understanding. There was a time before trees. So let's go into the fossil record. Can you tell us about the, uh, I'm going to say the rise of trees, which sounds very evocative. <laughs> but what, what were the, what was it like the first, when we had the first trees? All right. So I want you to think back to the Silurian. So this is not the first trees, but these are the first land plants. So the first okay. land plants are non-vascular, the itty little bitty guys. You know, they're, they're basically mosses. Okay. So from the Silurian into the mid-Devonian, we go from having itty bitty little, like, moss to the first tree. That's (laughs) really not that much time. (laughs) So the first tree, this one's argued, um, could be Watesia. Um, So this is from the mid-Devonian about 385 million years ago. It's found, the, the best examples of it are found in New York State. Um... And this is from a group that is related to ferns and horsetails. So vaguely reminiscent of, of, of them. They're not, I don't remember if this group is around today, but related ferns and horsetails. And it's important to remember, this is not like a tree, like we know it. Instead of having leaves, it had fronds, like a fern. Um, and then instead of having seeds, it had spores. Huh. So I believe the paper on this came out in 2007. So there's still some debate of whether or not this is actually a tree. But the first possible tree, Mid-Devonian, the earliest undisputed, yes, this was definitely a tree, is from the is in the late Devonian. So actually not that much later. Um, about 383 million years later. So, or 300 million years later. So about 383 million years ago. So about 2 million years later. Um, and that is our dear friend, Archaeopteris. Not yeah. to be confused <laughs> with some feathered dinosaur thing. Episode 37. So, it's, so the spelling here is actually important 
So Archeo is ancient, and it's not Pteryx. That means wing. So that's um, going to be our friend Archaeopteryx, the bird thing. Um, this is Archaeopteris. So P-T-E-R-I-S, Pteris, means fern. So this is ancient fern, which makes sense. You know, fern, yeah. <laughs> ferns and feathers look very similar, so I understand <laughs> why the words look very similar. But I feel like the people who, who named this knew exactly what they were doing. Like, just trying to confuse people. I kind of love it, though. It's darn paleobotanists. <laughs> the worst. Um, yeah, so Archaeopteris is the first definitely tree. The cool thing about it is that, so unlike, not necessarily unlike um, animals, but to a greater extent than am animals, there are just a lots, lot of parts of plants, lots of parts of trees that don't look anything like each other and may not be preserved anywhere near each other. So this is something that uh, happens a lot, particularly in these Paleozoic forests, um, where you'll find the roots. The roots will get one name, and you'll find the stem. The stem will get one name, and then the leaves will get another name, and the, the, the uh, reproductive structures will get another name. So Archaeopteris, I believe that's the name of the leaf, um, and because it came first, it's the name of the whole thing. Um, but the wood is called Calyxalon. So oh. you have issues with multiple names for the same thing. And mm -hmm. the, so Archaeopteris is uh, a pro-gymnosperm. So a pro-gymnosperm, like, you know, a pro-sauropod. Um, pro means proto, like it's not there yet. So before the gymnosperms. Um, so pro-gymnosperms look very much like gymnosperms, but instead of having needles or leaves like that, they have fronds. And instead of having seeds, they have spores. Um, so these were actual trees. Um, they could be 80 feet tall, so 24 meters. Um, wow. A meter and yeah. a half in diameter. Five wow. feet in diameter. And they look like a, I saw it described as a top-heavy Christmas tree. <laughs> uh, my advisor uh, describes them looking at like uh, Dr. Seuss trees. So very long trunk, and then at the very top, you have all of the all of the fronds. So Oops. exactly. So this is um, actually an index fossil from the late Devonian to the early Carboniferous. So they're very very common. They're very distinct, um, and they are the earliest trees, and they have probably the best name. And that's a tree. Yeah, like, that's not you know it just meets the height requirement. Like no, that's a big tree. <laughs> I was going to say, plants did not waste any time. <laughs> like, they were like, we got lignin, we got deep roots, the sun's up there, 80 feet. <laughs> That's what I was say, let's go to the sun. There's no ceiling. <laughs> exactly. The ceiling can't wow. hold us. Just right off the bat. Yeah. Plants don't That's mess around. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, no. Apparently not. How long did it take vertebrates to get on land? Jeez. That's what yeah. I'm saying. <laughs> yeah. Well, you had to have the plants up there first. To, like, you know, have oxygen. And then the, the animals are like, oh, all right, we'll, we'll follow, we'll follow. Well, it's like, you know, the, the video, uh, History of the World, where it zooms through. And yeah. they have the moment where the, the earliest uh, tetrapods come out. And it's like, hey, come on land. It goes, no, there's no food up there. And then keeps tempting them to come up until they finally do. But in, in that example, it would be, no, it's just moss. <laughs> <laughs> Where did the sun go? Exactly. Yeah, so then, so that's the first tree. But very soon after that, they were no longer alone. And so that's when we get the earliest tree-dominated biome. You know, the Carboniferous. It's yeah. literally named after the plants. Because the car <laughs> Carboniferous, carbon-bearing, coal swamps, those were trees. Um, so they are present basically the entire Carboniferous. So to set the scene, all right, thinking back to these coal swamps. So you have high temperature, you have high precipitation, and you have high oxygen, which is good for like bugs. It's not good for plants to have high oxygen because plants are flammable. <laughs> so uh, one of my, my colleagues, um, I think she's in Bristol. So she studies fire um, in the fossil record. And they had, they were studying the Carboniferous forest and they, they wanted to see 
this is very dangerous. Don't try this at home. Um, they, <laughs> they wanted to see at what level of oxygen things spontaneously burst into flames. Um, and the Carboniferous is actually getting pretty close to that. So they, wow. it's really cool. So these the world on fire. Yeah, <laughs> literally. I'm, gl- I'm glad we had you on here because we have not yet had to say "Don't try this at home." <laughs> That's true. The podcast. So thanks. <laughs> yeah. You're welcome. Practical botany. Um, so <laughs> these forests are Dr. Seuss forests. They just have weird shapes, and strictly speaking, I don't know if they have true wood. I think some of, I think most of them do. So I think they actually pedantically count as trees um but they look completely different in their different groups than we see today so you have um you have ferns you have seed ferns um you have pro gymnosperms you have um things that are related to horsetails you have things that are uh lycophytes so club mosses spike mosses quill warts you probably have never actually seen one so yeah sigularia lepidodendron which is also a very, very good name for a plant. Um, Calamites. So the, the cool thing about these, these forests is that because the oxygen is so high, um, the hydrology of the trees themselves is fundamentally different than trees today. So remember, I said it's very flammable. So these trees, <laughs> there's a lot of evidence to show that these trees are just pumping re- ridiculous amounts of water through their tissues, possibly as an adaptation to not be on fire. Wow. Yeah. Uh, built in uh, a fire extinguisher system. Wow. Yeah. They're fire hoses. That's a, that's a yeah. wet sprinkler system. Yeah. Where exactly. the water is in the pipes the whole time. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> so uh, originally people thought that they were just, oh, they're primitive. They they don't have very um, effective or efficient plumbing. It's like, or maybe they did it on purpose. So not to be on fire, which is nice. absolutely amazing. So in the Carboniferous, you have these extensive coal swamps. Um, and like the preservation here is just amazing. So there's a, a locality in Illinois, Maison Creek. Um, where you have these nodules and you just crack open nodules. It's like, oh, that's an entire fern. Oh, that's another fern. Oh, that's another fern. Like, it's amazing. It's exceptional. You can see the spores on the fronds. Um, so you have these extensive forests. And then at the end of the Carboniferous, um, you see changes. So the center of the continent starts to become drier. So in the outsides of the higher latitudes, you have the beginning of conifers. So gymnosperms are arising on the outside. And then basically in the center of the continent where these rich forests were, you are starting to have increased seasonality and increased aridity. And they are, these plants were, they evolved to be fire hoses. They don't do well if they don't have a lot of water. And so what ended up happening was you have these isolated pockets of, of forest and they can't move in between and you have this huge uh, extinction. So that's the Carboniferous rainforest collapse. So at the end of the Carboniferous going into um, the Permian, you have a fundamentally different biome structure. So instead of having all of these really lush forests, you'll have much smaller isolated forests in the higher latitudes, which is really cool, but really sad because a lot of them went extinct. Yeah. (laughs) Now for clarity, when you say the continent, we are talking at this time period about Pangea. The best continent. There was, Mm -hmm. there was the continent. There was only the one. Which is really interesting because if you think about it, if you're in the center of Pangea, you're really, really far from the coast. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that's like a, you know, if, which is great if it's, if it's humid, but once you have increased aridity, you're not going to be bringing in, you know, wet air. It's like a super desert. Yeah. And to, you know, we like plants and all, but to talk mm-hmm. about animals for a second, <laughs> all of this, this, tree setting right this this the time period that we see the rise of these forests and these early tree dominated biomes 
are also the times that we see a lot of diversification in animals. Mm -hmm. So we've talked on the podcast here and there before about the rise of early tetrapods and amphibians and then early reptiles. And then a little later on, the early mammal relatives, episode 47, early synapses and stuff. This is taking place with this background. Like Ali said, you needed the plants on land before the animals could really go on land. And yeah, with environmental diversity, you're, you start to see more diversity in the creatures that inhabit those biomes. Yeah, but plants are not just your green background. They had to do <laughs> substantial engineering. And so forests greatly, that's a great segue, uh, forests greatly alter landscapes. That's what I do. You're professional. So <laughs> starting with Archaeopteris. So the trees, especially if they're deciduous, when they drop their uh, when they drop their leaves or fronds or whatever they have, this leaf litter or plant litter can it's it's basically how a good way of getting nutrients into the system. So the there's evidence that shows that the the leaf litter left behind by Archaeopteris went into the water and led to a huge diversification of freshwater fish because suddenly there was just a lot more nutrients. And so you had a lot more options. And then in addition, this is the first plant with a substantial root system. This is the first time you really have true soil. So, you know, the smaller plants, they they don't really have extensive roots. It's, It's once you get these really deep roots that are mechanically and chemically altering the soil, like you have actual soil that's forming. You don't really have that before that. And in fact, so the Carboniferous forests changed the hydrology of the planet. So before that, water was going from high elevation to low elevation. And that was, that's basically it. Once you have the, once you get to the Carboniferous and you have substantial plants as basically (laughs) obstacles, um, then the, the, the water has to move around. And that's when you see basically the difference from just like sheets of water to these, you know, braiding um, systems, which that's when you really get the first true floodplains because it's changing the hydrology of the system. And so the train changing the hydrology of the system, making like, you know, putting the leaf litter and the woody degree debris into the soil um, and into the water, you're fundamentally changing the environment. And then today, rainforest specifically, but most forests, make their own weather. (laughs) So plants are tubes that bring water from the soil and they release it into the atmosphere. They don't really want to, but you know, chemistry happens. Um, And so by taking the water that was in the soil and then putting it into the atmosphere, that develops clouds, which is why rainforests are cloudy. And then that those clouds rain down onto the forest and they, they're basically their own system. And so 50 to 80% of the moisture in the Amazon stays in the Amazon. It doesn't go anywhere because the trees pump it up and then the the clouds pump it down and the trees pump it up. And because of there, there's just the sheer amount of moisture, the Amazon affects rainfall in the in North America. And the, the tropical rainforests in Southeast Asia affect the rainfall in Southeast, uh, Southeastern Europe and China. So they're kind of a big deal. So tree, the, the development of trees, the innovation. I always like to think of trees as an innovation. Oh, they are. Came up with. Yes. Like legs. For, yeah, in, exactly. Invertebrates. Like you, a yes. whole new way to live quite literally terraformed yeah. the yes. planet. Yes. Yeah. I love, uh, the on the note of them making their weather, the videos of, like the time-lapse videos of the rainforest just producing clouds yep. is one of my favorite things that exists. And I, I love telling people about it just because it's, it looks Photoshopped. Like, yeah. you know, when it's like, they make their own weather, weather, see like this fake example, but it's actually just them pumping out water vapor and creating the moisture in the air. But also the idea that <laughs> of the time before soil. Yeah. Like, it was weird when we talked about that there was a world before grass and it was not too long ago. But it's like, you know, yeah, and this was before we had made soil. That's what was happening now. That's weird. Yeah, the first invertebrates, the first little bugs that crawled up onto land were in a world largely without soil. I don't like it. 
Well, and also a world without rivers. Like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> just fundamentally different. Like, before plants, so basically before the Carboniferous, it is an alien world. Like, the Paleozoic in general is a weird time. <laughs> but, like, before the Carboniferous, it's like, for me, it is literally unimaginable. Like, my brain just can't. I keep trying to put things, nope, that wasn't around. Oh, no, nope, we didn't have those either. Like, it's it's very difficult. Like, it's, I, I personally work in the Cenozoic. Like, I understand how this works. I know yes. who everybody is. The Paleozoic <laughs> is a weird, weird time. Well, then, to get t- closer to your comfort zone, we will start moving forward in time and look at the progressive history of trees and forests after this short break. So, late Paleozoic, we see the origins of trees and tree-dominated biomes. Now let's move forward. As trees progress, as we move into the Mesozoic era, past the end of the Permian, episode 45, what sort of changes do we see in trees? So before we move to the Mesozoic, I want to touch on the Permian just a little bit. Okay. So the Permian is a terrible time to be a plant. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) That's the subheader on the chapter. (laughs) Yes. For the Permian period, don't be a plant. Yes. Because remember before I mentioned the super desert in the middle of Pangaea. Um, And so you have just these restricted forests in the high latitudes. Okay, and then bad things happened at the end of the Permian. Episode 45. (laughs) So bad things happened to plants at the end of the Carboniferous, and then it wasn't great in the Permian, and then bad things happened in the Permian. So, like, the end of the Paleozoic is not, not good for plants. But once we get into the Mesozoic, things start to change. So the forests in the Paleozoic were mostly composed of groups that either aren't trees today, aren't common today, or are dead today. So (laughs) you had pro-gymnosperms, those die out at the end of the Carboniferous. Um, You have ferns, which there are some tree ferns, which aren't strictly trees, um, in the tropics and subtropics and in uh, like Australia and New Zealand. Um, But primarily ferns are understory. Um, And then you have like copsids, so like the spike mosses, club mosses, quillworts that I have never seen one in real life. And I'm a (laughs) botanist. so. Um, So yeah, then you have the conifers. They arrive in the late Carboniferous, and they somehow survive the Permian. Good job, Conifers. So once we get into the Mesozoic, that's when the Conifers and other gymnosperms, that's when they take over. So even in the Triassic, that was still not a good time to be a plant. Um, Because you still, you know, the the continent's coming apart, um, but you still have this really, really dry continental interior. So trees don't like deserts. It's not a good place to be a tree. Um, so in the high latitudes, so, you know, the polar regions at each at each end, you have these gymnosperm forests, and they're associated with rivers and lakes. Um, there are some lycophytes and, like, glossopterids uh, holdovers. Glossopterids are really weird. They're really cool. They're really weird. They die out at the end of the Triassic, but they have these strap leaves. They're part of the reason we know about Pangaea is because of Glossopteris, um, because they found it in all these different places. Like, oh, these all look the same. What if they were touching once? Um, <laughs> so those friends die out at the end of the uh, the end of the Triassic. And once you get into the Jurassic, oh, man, what a time to be a plant. So the continental <laughs> interior becomes humid. So where you once had these, like, super deserts, you have forests. So, and these forests are dominated by groups... Of, of gymnosperms of conifers that we actually have today. So you have groups like Araucaria, so that's like Norfolk pines or monkey puzzle trees, um, Pinaceae, that's pines, um, Taxaceae, yews, and then other, um, other groups that you may or may not be familiar with. Um, in the Jurassic, in the low latitudes, so near the equator, the only extinct group of gymnosperms 
that's it was they dominated. Uh, Kiro Lepidodaci. So they they die out at the end of the Cretaceous, um, but they are super common in the Jurassic in these in these equatorial belts. Um, Ginkgo, which you Ooh. may have heard of. <laughs> uh, it, so it's a gymnosperm, and it is the uh, it is common in the basically between the equator where the Kiro uh, the Kiro Lepidodacea is, and then the um, the higher latitudes where you have other weird things. Um, but the ginkgo, that's like this is their heyday. Um, poor ginkgo, they they have a tough have a tough time. So in the Jurassic is when we start seeing these these forests, and the cool thing about it is in terms of the sp- the groups that you see, they're plants that you would probably recognize. Like, I've seen something like that before. But the weird thing about it is we're not used to seeing conifers on the equator. Yeah, I was going to say, that's what I was going to say is, so this Jurassic, dinosaurs, uh, no grass lands, angiosperms, episode 57, are not really really on the scene much yet. But you mentioned earlier that today the gymnosperm-dominated forests are at the highest latitudes, way up north, way down south. Mm-hmm. I guess mostly way up north. Yeah. But at this time, your gymnosperm, your conifer-dominated biomes are in the tropics. Yeah, they're everywhere, but they're in the tropics. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's a weird it's a weird uh, 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 mishmash of like recognizable plants. You have forests, so you know. That that's at least familiar. No grasslands and the types of plants you recognize are in the wrong places. Yeah, right. So, yeah, it's it's uh still kind of alien, but it's 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 like someone who didn't know put it back together. <laughs> they put things all in the wrong spots. Exactly, exactly. So that's that's the Jurassic. So the Jurassic, like, oh, great time. It is the heyday of of gymnosperms. Like this was the best time to be a gymnosperm was the Jurassic. And then we get into the Cretaceous. Ooh. So during the Cretaceous, so you know when you see a term, like, oh, I've never heard of that before. And then after that, it's everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> so that's that was my recent experience with the Cretaceous Terrestrial Revolution. I had yeah. never heard this phrase before. And all of a sudden, just it showed up everywhere. It was in the paper we read for Journal Club last week. It was in the research I was doing today. Like, it's a thing. But specifically, it... Part of that is the appearance of, of angiosperms. So like the, this, this increase in angiosperms. So you still have these forests that are dominated by um, gymnosperms, but you're beginning, you know, here and there, little, little, little angiosperms are pushing their way in. And the other really cool thing about the Cretaceous is that you have these polar forests. Yeah. So you have Arctic and Antarctic forests. And the cool thing about them is that their seasonality is driven by light as opposed to temperature or precipitation, which is cool. just a fundamentally different system. Um, yeah, it's, it's, we don't, we don't necessarily know how it works. We don't, <laughs> we, like, we don't understand how you went that long without light. Uh, give it some time and we'll have polar forests again and we'll find out. We're working on it. Oh, oh, that's the scientist in me is like the paleontologist in me is super excited about that. He's like, oh yep. yeah, we could test this. And then the climate scientist in me is like, oh no, don't do that. That's bad. Yeah, that's how I feel about the the prospect of having lots of shallow oceans back again. Yeah, that's cool on one side of it. Bring, yes. Hashtag bring back the mosasaurus. <laughs> yes. Polar forests. I think are my favorite example of an extinct biome. Yeah. Yes. That's a really good one. Cuz like you said, how do you even how can you be a forest that doesn't get light for 5 months? Right. Exactly. And we don't we don't know. And they actually um they continue on on um into the Cenozoic and I have uh one of my friends, he studies um the I think it's an Eocene um flora from Ellesmere Island um Ooh. in Canada. So like that's 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 Arctic, and they 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 you have these broadleaf angiosperms, um, and we just like they they just don't understand because they're they're it's it's relatively warm like these, some of these leaves are pretty big. It's like, but what do you do when you don't have like you're not, there's no lights? 
Anyway. So <laughs> I guess for, for some clarification for listeners, uh, antiocerans, by the way, flowering plants, in case you haven't listened to episode 57. So look out your window, pick a plant. That's probably an angiosperm. <laughs> Uh, and then the reason that you had these polar forests in the Cretaceous, and, you know, for, for a lot of this stretch of Mesozoic, is that this was a time where the global climate was warm enough that there wasn't permanent ice and snow at the poles. In our modern world, our modern, what is sometimes called ice house conditions. Not for much longer. Eh, yeah. It's always, it never gets warm enough at any point in the year for all the ice on the caps to melt. But back at this time, back in the Cretaceous, it got warm enough that your ice, basically in the summertime, your caps were largely ice-free. You didn't have ice caps. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And so you have these forests that are um, in, the, in the far north and far south. And it's interesting because in the... Um, so through the Cretaceous, the conifers and the cycads and the ferns are steadily replaced by angiosperms. And gymnosperms, but replaced by angiosperms. And the other cool thing is, so remember when I just said we don't know how they worked, apparently the Arctic and Antarctic forests worked differently. Of course they did. Of course they did. So well, one, one, one had penguins and one had polar bears, it, obviously. Obviously. Yes. <laughs> and they have very different gardening preferences. Yes. <laughs> so Arctic forests are predominantly deciduous, so they're dropping their leaves. Presumably, when it's dark out. Um, but the Antarctic forest was predominantly evergreen, so they were holding on to their leaves. I don't know. How do you even... My, my expression is one of incredulity. Yeah. How do you be evergreen when you don't have light for yeah. half the year? I don't know. <laughs> it could be. It could be. So, kind of side note about what it means to be evergreen or deciduous, because um, it is important when you're talking about forests. So, deciduous, you... Drop your leaves at some point. It could be because it's cold. It could be because it's dry. Evergreen means you're holding on to those suckers for as long as you can. And the reason for that is how much work you put into making it. So an evergreen leaf tends to be a much heftier leaf. They tend to be much thicker. Um, and just in general, the plant is putting a whole lot more work into these evergreen leaves because they are going to hold on to them for a while. Um... Whereas deciduous leaves, they tend to be pretty flimsy because you're going to drop them soon. So, like, why put any effort into it? So that could be it, right? So in the Arctic forest, they're not putting a whole lot into their leaves because they're going to just kind of drop them in a few months anyway. But maybe these Antarctic forests are putting just a lot more work into these leaves. And so they don't want to give them up, even though it's dark out. It's like when you buy a really nice new outfit. And you're totally overdressed for the occasion, but like you paid a lot of money for that, and yeah. you're gonna look nice. <laughs> <laughs> like using a way too nice tool for a job, right? So, yeah, but I have it, right? So why wouldn't I use this tool? Yeah, <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> That's so interesting. Cool, neat. Yeah, yeah, it is neat. It is neat. So <laughs> at the end of the Cretaceous, there was a bad day. Episode five. So th through the end of the Cretaceous, you, you're seeing this increase in angiosperms, and then there's a bad day at the end of the at the end of the Cretaceous, and it didn't affect. So the end Cretaceous extinction did not affect plants in the same way that it affected um, animals. So in fact, only one family of gymnosperms went extinct. So the, I mentioned it before: the Chirolepididaceae groups of angiosperms did go extinct, but in general. They actually didn't do so bad. And it's really cool. So some of my um, colleagues are working in the early Paleocene. So like 65 million years ago, basically right after. And they already have these these extensive forests with relatively good um, diversity in New Mexico, which wasn't really that far from Mexico. No, that's yeah. in the blast path. Yeah. Yeah. Of the, so the asteroid impact. It didn't. And we really shouldn't be that surprised that plants didn't take very long to recover. I mean, it didn't take them very long to go from being on land to being trees. Like, a little asteroid <laughs> is not going to not gonna be the end of things for plants. Well, I mean, we can watch reforestation happen after volcanoes wipe a place out. Exactly. Yeah. You know? And I mean, that's got to be fairly comparable to the level of devastation. And if plants can just go... 
Uh, lava bed? Okay. Well, they can do this wonderful thing that animals can't do, where they can, like, throw a bunch of babies on the ground and say, now you stay there until conditions are good. Yeah. Don't come up until the air is clear and things are good again, and you're not going to ex- erupt into flames. And then they do. And we're playing the quiet game <laughs> until, <laughs> yeah. until we don't die. Don't come back until the Paleocene. <laughs> exactly. And it's it's amazing because basically from the very beginning of the Cretaceous, if you ignore the weirdo animals and you ignore <laughs> the distinct lack of grass, <laughs> it's fundamentally a very similar system to today. The only difference, um, in addition to not having grasslands, they're actually, ready for this, there were no true rainforests until um, at least partway through the Paleocene. I have visited Castle Rock. Yes, that's that's Which is the famous, that's next. are you going to talk about, okay, good. Yes. <laughs> uh, so I knew that Castle Rock, which you'll hear about in a second, is this famous rainforest site I did not know that it was among the first. They argue that it is the first. So dinosaurs, in the non-bird sense, didn't have rainforests? So rainforest, this is this is when I put my pedantic hat back on. Sure, sure. So rainforest means something very specifically from a hydrologic standpoint. The way that, as I mentioned before, the way that rainforests move water is very particular. Um, and they were able to look at, they were able to look at it with isotopes from a site from Panama. I believe it might have been late Paleocene or early Eocene. Um, and you, it takes a long time to see these actual hydrologic, like all these actual water isotope patterns that we see in modern rainforests until you don't really see that until the Paleocene. You, even though in terms of the space that they're taking up, they are reminiscent of a rainforest, but pines and, you know, conifers in general, gymnosperms in general, are not thirsty like angiosperms are. Angiosperms move a lot of water, and they transpire a lot of water. And so gymnosperms just fundamentally don't make their own weather. And this, They're not hydrologic engineers in the same way that angiosperms are. However, I have heard arguments that in the... Uh, Carboniferous, when you have these trees that are just fire hoses, maybe they did. Maybe they were hydrologically reminiscent of a rainforest, but I don't know. So if that's true, then the, the, the time span would go rainforests, dinosaurs, more rainforests. Yeah. Correct. <laughs> like dinosaurs today would be really miffed to discover that they just completely missed. They lived in the rainforest gap yep. because of the darn gymnosperms. That's what it sounds like. It's true. It's it's because of Pines and Friends. Yeah. No, and that's, it's such a weird concept to be like, you could have a forest, you know, rivaling, you know, size-wise, today's giant rainforests. Right. And in the same place. Yeah, yes. in the same spot, same size, just minus that crucial rain part. Huh. Weird. So tell us about Castle Rock. So <laughs> Castle Rock is really cool. If you've ever gone to, like, a botanical garden... And gone to like the tropical greenhouse, you should do that. Like, because <laughs> <laughs> plants in the tropics, particularly in tropical rainforests, their leaves get real big, real yeah. big. And so <laughs> some of the leaves that they, they have from Castle Rock are honking huge. They're absolutely enormous. And the thing about it, I, I, I need you to appreciate this. Dear listener, please appreciate that. Paleobotany fieldwork is fundamentally different from vertebrate paleontology fieldwork. So in vertebrate paleontology, you're wandering around looking on the ground until you see something neat and you try to figure out where it came from. That's that's basically it. <laughs> in paleobotany, we move mountains. So we have to, we determine a layer that we think that there will be fossil leaves in, and then we remove hills because um, leaves tend to be preserved in like floodplains, and so they tend to be preserved like literally leaves in a book. Um, and in order to see them, you have to take out a block and crack it open. But the important thing to consider is, in the words of Dr. Peter Wilf, um, you can't get big leaves out of small rocks. 
<laughs> so <laughs> the, yeah that math doesn't add up that, no, so the, the bigger the leaves the bigger the blocks that you have to move to get the leaves out of so i also ran into this when i was working um in with my research in kenya and one of my sites it's possibly a rainforest it might be just a little bit too dry to be a rainforest but these leaves are enormous and the blocks that we had to pull out and we were still only getting fragments like how big is this leaf that we can't get the whole thing <laughs> so if you don't if you don't remember anything else please remember that you can't get big leaves out of small rocks and the amount of physical labor <laughs> that goes into excavating a rainforest like the one at castle rock is exceptional I want you can't get big leaves out of small rocks to be the new you can't get blood from a stone. <laughs> you can't get a we'll have a shirt. We'll make yes. a shirt. <laughs> Funnily enough, Dr. Peter Wolf is the person who introduced me to Castle Rock. Ah. Because he was, for a short time, he was my advisor. Because, and I, he taught the class that I took that we went on a field trip out to Colorado, uh, which is where Castle Rock is. Yes. Right? It's like near Denver. Yes. Most things cool. in, are near Denver. That's, yeah, that's very true. <laughs> Peter Wolf was the first of two paleobotanists, the first, actually the first two paleobotanists I ever met who are both very tree-like themselves. <laughs> so, fun fact, um, men who are paleobotanists resemble Ents. That's, that yes, was the do. comparison I was about to make. Yep. Yes. I met the, the first two paleobotanists that I met. In fact, I think the only two... Kirk Johnson? Men, yeah. It's yep. Kirk, Kirk Johnson and Peter Wolf who are both over six and a half feet tall they, <laughs> and proportionate they're not yeah. like they're like our friend sean yeah, yeah yeah they're not like tall and skinny it's just a scaled up human yeah. being that yeah. is exactly how i describe them they are human scaled up to 150 percent. they are ants <laughs> like it's great however it makes it a lot easier for them to work in rainforests because they are big enough to actually handle the rocks, but I am a mere puny human, and it was more <laughs> difficult for me. You are a shrub. <laughs> so Castle Rock is Paleocene, right on the other side of the End Cretaceous Extinction boundary. Correct. Correct. So that is when we see the the, the rise of the, the rainforest. And so it's, it's important to, to remember. So the Cenozoic, so in the Paleozoic, they did those those trees in the Paleozoic, they they put in the heavy lifting like they did the hard work you know the early plants they gave us oxygen i mean that's a bit of a, an exaggeration but might as well be they're related to plants plants changed you know plants are the reason there are soil plants are the reason there are rivers all of these things that the carboniferous forests did i appreciate that the next big innovations come in the cenozoic so at the beginning of the cenozoic in the paleozoic that's when we have uh, excuse me, in the Paleocene, that's when we have the rise of the rainforest, which is might be my favorite biome, but I'm a bit, I'm a bit uh, biased. Um, and then the other innovation that we get in the, is in the Cenozoic, and that's the rise of grasslands. Mm -hmm. uh, Episode 38. <laughs> I, I left a pause for you to say that. <laughs> but even from the very beginning, um, the, the Cenozoic, they're actually... <laughs> There's not much I need to say about forests in the Cenozoic because you've experienced them. They've been <laughs> basically the same all through time, the, the Cenozoic time at least. The big difference has been who is where. So, for example, um, part of the research that I did in my master's with you friends um, hey. was I looked at the, um, the fossils from the Neogene of Eastern North America and they compared them to um, basically where those groups live today. And it's amazing because in the mid-Atlantic of North America, there were tree ferns. We don't have those anymore. And that's only like 20 million years ago. Yeah. But, so, wow. Yeah, between okay. 20 and 2.3, right? So it's, <laughs> it's absolutely amazing that, you know, we have this shift in who is where. So speaking of palms, not forests, but speaking of palms... Um, cause they're not trees. <laughs> Palms are actually super common in the Paleocene. They occur in forests. Wow. In North America, in the Paleocene, the early Paleocene, which is interesting hmm. because today 
you know, in like the southeast, you'll have like the the cute little like you know uh, sago palms, which are cycads. They're not also not palms, which are not trees. <laughs> Common names That's are rough. rough. <laughs> um, but in the in like Africa, you will have palms make up making up a a decent um, um proportion of the forests. But palms didn't get to Africa until actually relatively recently. So. Plants, they'll get there eventually. They're slow movers. <laughs> Neat. Cool. Yeah. While we're in the Neogene, and because you mentioned your master's work, and you mentioned uh, uh, plants sort of th- changing distribution and stuff throughout the Neogene, would you be able to make a brief note about the plants at our favorite fossil site? Yes! The gray fossil site? The gray fossil site! I actually have been talking to Chris Widga about this. Because I have oh, thoughts cool. about the plants <laughs> for the Gray Fossil Site. Good. We need more. But we have, so uh, Dr. Elizabeth Hermson I'd... is currently doing a bunch of work on plants right now. Uh, Gray Fossil Site, by the way, episode 14. But there's other, like, distribution has, mm-hmm. I have been told by Allie that the most interesting thing about the plants at Gray is the distribution of the plants. I agree. I I agree with myself. I, 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 second, I second this again. <laughs> Smart lady, that alley. So the thing that I find most interesting about the plants from, from the Gray Fossil Site is, like <laughs> David said, I said, the change in the distribution. <laughs> so if you look at the genus level, so basically, you know, maples and elms and hickories like that. You look at the genus level, the forest at Gray is fundamentally the same as it is in East Tennessee today. You see the same genera. You see the same groups in a similar composition. There are some weirdos um, because it is the Neogene. Um, But by and large, one of my favorite things to tell people is if you were to get out of a time machine at Gray or go, you know, go into a time machine at Gray and then get out of the time machine at the time of the deposition of the Gray Fossil Site, you might not be able to tell just by looking at the plants. Then a taper would go by, like, whoa, that's not supposed to be here. <laughs> um, but if you look at the species level, and if you look at the actual, um, the um, how the species are related to each other, that's when it gets really interesting. Because, and this is what I've been talking to Chris Widga about, I have questions. So at the time of the deposition of the Gray Fossil Site, all of these genera that we have today in East Tennessee are actually more closely related to their cousins in East Asia. So all of these species that are the exact like the exact same genus that's there today, it's actually not as closely related to its cousins who are there today as it is to its cousins that live in East Asia. And I don't understand why. <laughs> so one of the things you have to remember um is so the whole reason there are these disjunct populations so the reason that you have the same um genera in east uh eastern north america and east asia is because at one time we had these nifty little land bridges all across the northern hemisphere and so our dear plant friends they take a while but they get there were distributed all around the northern hemisphere and then over time, there was this like, you know, ice age thing. Um, so they closed the land bridges and then this rude chunk of ice covered a good chunk of North America and that changed things. So because you didn't have this flow between the um, East Asian and the Eastern North America uh, groups anymore, they began to look different. And so something happened. Why are they different? Why do these look like the uh, East Asian groups and not the Eastern North America. I don't understand. I blame the Ice Age, but I would be really interested to see if you can, if that affinity, like how far that affinity goes. You know, we know that taxonomically it works, but I would, I'd be wondering if, you know, if you nerded out and looked at the details of the anatomy, if you'd actually be able to tell. I think it's fascinating. I absolutely love it, but I don't understand it. It's also the case with the animals. Yes, so obviously the famous red panda is an obvious example, but also like the badger at the Gray Fossil Site is a Eurasian badger, not an American badger. Mm-hmm. And then we this is why I I say if anyone's going to come out of the you know in future literature and show that Zelantophus, our new snake, isn't new, it's going to be somebody who cuts open a snake in East Asia 
and goes, oh, these vertebrae, I saw these in a paleontological <laughs> study. Like, ah, it is that. There's these interesting connections. But of course, uh, that sounds like future research, potentially, of yours. But you're doing research on trees right now. This is true. I am doing research on both modern and fossil trees because I have diversified. <laughs> so basically... I am doing research on modern trees so we can understand what fossil trees were doing. So, slight backup. I really, uh, this is blasphemous as a, a botanist and I apologize. My favorite part of the tree are the leaves. And if you ask <laughs> any botanist, leaves are the worst way to identify a plant <laughs> of any kind. But it's what's preserved in the fossil record. So that's what we have to work with. And we know that there's a relationship between the shape of leaves and the environment that the plant was growing in. So, unfortunately, most of the data associated with this understanding of the relationship between leaf shape and climate um, is from the temperate northern hemisphere. Let's be real, mostly North America. Um, <laughs> and so, while broadly this pattern holds in many places, uh, the tropics are a beast unto themselves, um, especially Africa. And no work had been done looking at the relationship between leaf shape and the environment in tropical Africa. And that was an issue because I was working on a really cool fossil site in tropical Africa and <laughs> not having this fundamental understanding of the relationship between leaf shape and climate, which is how we estimate paleoclimate. It meant that we can't estimate the paleoclimate from this, this fossil site. And so I am, it's a daunting task uh, <laughs> because in order to make this worthwhile, you have to include a lot of data. Um, and so I'm looking at leaves from trees from across tropical Africa um, to look at the relationship between, you know, we have a known temperature and precipitation, and we look at how does that affect the way the leaves look? And it's, the, the project keeps getting bigger, guys. <laughs> well, I mean, you started with such a small continent. I know, right? Yeah. I'm only using the middle of it. It's only the tropics. Yeah, around. it's just this section of it. Yeah, it's just, well, it's like that because yeah. Basically, I looked at a, I looked at a map of Africa and I was like, "Where is it green?" And that's what I used. <laughs> only these eight countries across Africa. Exactly because it's, it's more than that, but um, because, like I said, when you look at um, if you look at a picture of the planet where it's green. It's normally trees. And so if I look at it, go on Google Earth, like, oh, it's green there. All right, that's where I'm going to look. Yeah, so that's been a really fun project. And I'm, I'm hoping to do more things with that in the future. But the reason we started doing that was because of possibly my favorite fossil site. Sorry, uh -oh. Gray. Uh-oh. Well, how, how about this? My oh. favorite old world fossil site. Okay. All right. Yeah. You, you can still be on the podcast. Okay. You can have two. You can have two. That's okay. fine. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Thanks. So, Rasinga Island is the most beautiful place I have ever been. It is actual paradise. Um, while I was there, the we were there in the um, in the winter. It's the equator. There's really not winter. <laughs> but it was when I was on the island. It was the high was about eighty degrees. The mile, the, the island is only, you know, maybe 10 miles by three miles. So there's always a breeze off the water. Oh my goodness. There were birds chirping and goats adventuring to see what we were doing. It was beautiful. Um, and what we're looking at there is the reason that Rasinga Island is important is because it is, um, an early Miocene site, which means that it's where the early humans, early relatives, we're living. So basically proconsul, not exactly proconsul, but basically proconsul. So not strictly a direct um, ancestor to us, but we're probably related to them. Uh, an early ape. Yes, <laughs> exactly. So it's important to vertebrate fossils can only tell you so much, right? So you can know exactly what the animal was doing. Um, you can, you know, look at the limbs and figure out locomotion. You can look at the teeth and figure out what it was eating, but you really can't understand, in most cases, um, you really can't fundamentally understand the environment unless you look at the plants. 
and they hadn't really done that there. And as I like to say, I am the context. So my work is providing the context, basically the green background. What was the green background and how warm or wet was it um, while the, during this, uh, this, the deposition of the site? And so I have these, uh, these sites that are about half a million years apart in time. And so we're looking at how they, ch how the environment changed. Because the cool thing is the, the mammal composition is changing except for the apes. Huh. Hmm. And the environment is changing. So the apes are able to adapt to variable climates in a way that other animals are not, which is really, really cool. So I've been looking at um, the composition. So I think one of my sites, fingers crossed, it might be a rainforest. I want it to be a rainforest because these leaves are honking huge and I want it to be worth it. But yeah, it's been absolutely amazing because like some of these leaf fossils have are utterly beautiful. And you look at it, you're like, yeah, that's a leaf. And that's one of the nice things to working with fossil leaves is it takes a lot of imagination if you so show someone a bone or a tooth to, for them to piece together the whole organism from it. But if you show someone a leaf, they're like, I know what that is. <laughs> that tree's over there, um, which is really nice. And it makes it really easy to get people, it, you know, people don't think they're excited about plants until they see a leaf fossil. Like, oh, I know what that is. And it's a, it's a really fun experience, but um yeah, so right, unfortunately, right now, I'm in the process of finishing my dissertation. So I don't actually get to do the fun stuff, like going into the field and like going to Kenya. But yeah, it's, it's, I think this project is super cool. And I like telling people about it. So <laughs> context, I am the context. It sounds super cool. You're Absolutely. the context for our earliest directly relevant evolutionary relatives. Yeah, it's true. That's that's not nothing. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I'm kind of a big deal. What can I say? <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks a lot, Allie, for joining us, for speaking for the trees. I am the Lorax. I speak for the trees. Thank you so much for letting me talk. I love talking about plants and not everybody wants to listen. So I appreciate <laughs> this. <laughs> well, now there are going to be hundreds of people who have no choice but to listen if they want to keep up with the episode. Yep. Yeah. You should listen. This is this was great. And if you've gotten this far, you already know that. <laughs> yes. No, we love having you on. Uh, our listeners love having you on and it'll happen again. Yes. It might not happen again super soon because you're going to you have a PhD thing to finish. It's it's true. They they're kicking me out of here, so I I, I need to do some <laughs> things. But before we go, as listeners of the podcast know, as Allie, I'm sure, knows, we uh, get patron questions sometimes. Yeah. So one of the things that our patrons can do is ask us questions and we will answer them on the podcast. And we happen to have a patron question that is perfectly suited to have Allie answer it on this episode. So Allie, we're going to throw a patron question your way. All right, I'm ready. This is a question from a patron whose name is Dread Pirate Rob. And the question goes, Will? So me riddle follows. I hear tell that by the middle o' the Carboniferous, there were big piles o' trees lying in valleys and swamps in river deltas. On account o' the trees getting ahead o' the Saffrophytes, arms race with the superweapons Lignin and Subarin for a couple of few tens o' millions o' years. How non-controversial be this thinking? And are there any beasties o' oh, that time that were adapted to the climbing around or swimming amongst fathoms and fathoms o' oh, fallen trees? Or that ye could speculate might have been adapted to the life amongst the fallen trees? Yo-ho! Our patrons are awesome. <laughs> that was beautiful! <laughs> so, to translate <laughs> what, what our pirate friend is asking is that... In the Carboniferous, so this time period we talked about where trees sort of became a big thing for the first time, they've heard that but trees had all that lignin and, and awesome wood building material that decomposers took millions of years to catch up. And so for a while, there may have been lots and lots of fallen trees that perhaps animals were adapted to climbing around in just these forests of dead trees. Uh, Allie, is that true? What do you what can you say? So uh, the Dread Pirate Rob asked if it's non-controversial. And I would think, I, so from what I know and from what I, I, I've researched, 
it actually it's it's pretty non-controversial we there is a lot of evidence that shows that yes part of the reason there was this buildup of carbon during the carboniferous is because you have this lag um and in fact this is a really popular research topic a lot of people are looking are looking into this right now which is actually super cool there's a lot of different ways to come at it um so there's actually been recent phylogenetic studies looking at groups of modern wood rotting fungi to see when this trait originated. And so the initial ability to break down lignin actually did arrive rather early in the Carboniferous, but they weren't able to break down lignin directly. So it had to break down a little bit, and then they were able to break down the byproducts. So the ability to actually directly break down lignin didn't occur until later on in the Carboniferous. And so that, coupled with the uh, the change in climate, so that increasing aridity, you have the ability for microbes to break things down, and you have just less deposition. And so that's why you see... Uh, these change at the end. The cool thing about it is that, so also asked about the wee beasties that were <laughs> living there. So people know about the huge dragonflies and, and things like that, the big old arthropods living in the uh, Carboniferous, but a lot of them, well, first of all, not all of them were huge. There are actually like normal sized arthropods living there during that time that were probably actually filling similar ish roles so they weren't um so that so work has shown that while there were fewer herbivores so you had fewer insects that were directly eating the plants there were some that were still that were probably doing some sort of uh detroit like were, they were probably some sort of detritivores but there were actually a lot of things living on the forest floor so there's this huge mi millipede <laughs> yes. related to uh arthroplora which was probably living on the on the forest floor. Um, a lot of so that's a myriapod, so that's a type of of or arthropod. Insects were probably living there. Um, arachnids. So even if they weren't necessarily ingesting the the fallen trees, they were definitely scurrying around and inhabiting that, which is kind of interesting because that means that basically since the origination of insects, they've been living in leaf litter. Which is kind of cool. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So just so, tons of dead wood. Yes. Home to tons of insects and early arthropods. Yeah. Cool. Which honestly is not that much different from what. So if you see a, a, a log and you you know you kick it open, all sorts of insects and you know millipedes and stuff are going to come crawling out, which is you know, today, and that's probably pretty similar to what was happening during the Carboniferous, which is always for me. A really nice thought. Like fundamentally, things have been the same. So even though the millipede is like six feet long, you know, at least there was a millipede. I like that. What I what what this brought to mind uh, for me was whenever you have those um those brush piles when you're like clearing an area and people are mm -hmm. just throwing all the branches and brush off to one side, so you end up with this big layer of sticks and pieces of logs. Like if you aren't on top of the job as quickly as some people might want you to be. And it sits around for a while in a yard, uh, which I've witnessed happen before. Uh, <laughs> yeah, my yeah. <laughs> St all sorts of animals start making their home in there. So it makes sense that even if things were not breaking down the forest as quickly as they do today, that you still would just have a perfect little jungle gym. Oh, for sure. Of sticks for them to scurry through. Yeah, ex exactly. So basically the same sort of thing that you, you see today. So literally the same as what you see today, except for, you know, going to be fewer hedgehogs if you're in the UK, you know, fewer <laughs> salamanders, <laughs> things like that. But by and large, like, it's the same sort of community, which, like I said, I just, I love it. It's And honestly, I'm sure that going back to uh, your conversations about rewilding North America with kudzu, mm -hmm. like this is a similar sort of thing. You just have all of these, you know, branches. You have this, basically, this, this biome, almost a biome that you don't really have represented today. That's like just this carnage of old trees. <laughs> yeah, it also makes me want to look closer at... Um what sort of arthropods are hanging around uh, forested lake bottoms where you get all the branches and trees that settle down there and you get that very underwater yeah. sort of equivalent to a forest floor. Yeah. 
Yeah, because like this, this, these are these are swamps. Like, there's mm-hmm. clearly water there. So I'm I I wouldn't be surprised if it's sort of like an analogous, a very similar sort of environment. I would absolutely love to take a time machine back to the Carboniferous and see all this stuff because like they're weird trees and big old bugs and I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Neat. Well, thank you for that uh, uh, eloquently worded question, Dread Pirate Rob. And thank you, Allie, for being here to answer it. My pleasure. As always. And thanks again for just being here to talk with us about plants. We love having you. <laughs> they need more love. I am the Paleolorax. I speak for the fossil trees. And in this episode, <laughs> very specifically, <laughs> yes, for the fossil trees. Yes. Thanks again to all of our patrons who support us, to our patrons who requested this episode. A reminder to everybody, check out Spooky. We just wrapped it up. And keep an eye out for our end of the year 2019 Q&A form. We'll be putting that up in all of our social medias. We release episodes every fortnight. We sure do. So the next one won't have Allie. Oh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not listening to that one. If it, listen, if we had Allie every time, it wouldn't be. As I would never graduate. <laughs> <laughs> that is very true. So we're gonna let you get back to your life of finishing a PhD. <laughs> <laughs> Listeners, we'll see you next time. Bye for now. Bye. Thanks for listening to the Common Descent Podcast. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and check our WordPress blog for pictures and links after each episode. Huge thanks to our patrons whose support helps keep this podcast running and who get access to bonus goodies on Patreon. The song you're hearing is called On the Origin of Species by Protodome, which we found at ocremix.org. Thanks again for listening. We hope you'll join us next time.